Happy Halloween, everyone! Welcome to a very special episode of the Armchair Scholar's Guide, as we take our victory lap around with the king of the vampires, Dracula. If you are just joining us now, the meat of the episodes has been in the previous three, starting with our look into the folkloric roots of vampirism, who Vlad Tepish was and what was behind his name, how the Irish writer and theatre manager crafted that name of the Wallachian prince into an immortal count, and the long, winding road that said undead nobleman took to get to Hollywood to land on the silver screen as one of the most enduring and important universal monsters. Of course, we couldn't truly end a discussion on Dracula there. After all, this vampire is one of the most celebrated and reimagined figures of literature, having been adapted across so many different types of media that, as I've stressed many times before, I don't know that anyone could possibly cover them all. That doesn't mean we can't take a look at some favorites, and less than loved adaptations, however. In the last episode of this podcast, I'd already covered how Dracula as a story has become so repeated, splintered, reimagined, and changed to accommodate his environment that, for our purposes, I'm approaching him now as I would a fairy tale. We've covered Brahms' version of the character, and I do believe that there is merit in recognizing the source material for what it is, and what made the Count an interesting character in the first place. But, as I've covered before, and particularly when it comes to the bootleg of Dracula in Istanbul, in creating this vampire under that name, Stoker created something much bigger that no single story could hold on to. That undead count was destined for more than just scaring Jonathan Harker and attacking good English women to spite their men. After he found his way to the silver screen, there was no keeping him hidden. And today, we're going to be covering some of my favorite versions of this character, as reimagined through different decades, and in different media. Some of them you already know about, as I've been promising to get to them, while others you may never have even heard of. While it would be tempting to just do a big list of some of these adaptations, there are just too many that are deserving of our attention for what they bring to the tale. In covering a list, we lose the nuance of what makes these different versions interesting and special. More than this, we don't get the sense of why they've survived or, in some cases, why they've been remembered only by a select few. As such, I'm going to go into this looking at the different supporting characters as well as Dracula, going over what's changed about them and how they've helped to build Dracula into this anxious fairy tale that we know now. We're also going to have a look at how these different adaptations have chosen to look at these characters to see just how far away from the original story they've come, but also how they've transformed into what we wanted them to say or be. I have chosen to highlight specific adaptations with the idea of opening up either a greater conversation about them, or just to give some attention to some of the stories that I think are more deserving of your time. So without further ado, let's start with a figure that's gotten probably the most dramatic treatment in the story, Van Helsing. Professor Abraham Van Helsing is a name that we now understand to mean vampire hunter. That said, while he was a guiding presence in the book, and the one to direct the actions of the Crew of Light, this hunter was not really the antithesis to Dracula as he would later become. We can thank Universal, and specifically Hamilton Dean and John Balderston, for introducing that into pop culture, but they did have sound reasoning for creating this version of the Professor. One of the challenges of bringing this story to life was the need to encapsulate everyone in a way that could be represented visually, and, in terms of the hunters, there were too many of them who weren't really distinctive enough to justify keeping them all. This is where we give rise to Van Helsing as a mentor hero, and we see it first in the 1931 film with Bela Lugosi. In the scene where he confronts Dracula with his lack of reflection, it is the first time that we see him as an active agent, rather than a director of the other members of his party. The scene where they are alone and facing off is even more telling, and would set up for what becomes of his character through the next round of adaptations. When Hammer came to call, most of the crew of Light had all but vanished, but Van Helsing remained, now solidified as the wise older man 
who had tackled this fiend before. Gone was the slightly awkward, good-natured professor who sometimes tripped on his English as he tried to communicate that the mourning and besotted young men who had witnessed the decline of someone they loved now had to kill someone who was already dead. In his Hammer persona, played by Peter Cushing, this version of the Vampire Hunter is stoic where his literary counterparts prior had been leaning more towards the fatherly or even grandfatherly side. In his place was a serious and jaded figure, world-weary and unmoved as he was compelled by an unceasing duty to rid the world of vampires and track their undead master, Dracula. Van Helsing was a doctor, so he wasn't necessarily squeamish about getting the dirty work done in the books. But this man, who rose from the Edward Van Sloan portrayal, was much colder about it. There is no love in him when he is rising against the vampires who terrorize the peasants of the Hammer world, but that doesn't mean he doesn't care about his work or the people around him. One of the elements of the story that Hammer emphasizes and brings more to the forefront, especially in their first treatment of Dracula from 1958, was Van Helsing's role as protector for the young lovers. Oftentimes, the young people around him are either ill-equipped to contend with the vampire or skeptical of what he's telling them, which is directly from the books. That said, the younger members on the side of good never entirely rise to the occasion either. While Van Helsing acted as director of his former crew, the role of defender that was set up by Universal was solidified by Hammer. Anytime Hammer has featured Van Helsing as a character, He's the one to give the fatal blow to the vampire. It is only through his wisdom and the strong arm of his resistance to the evil that the young lovers are granted their reunion and eventual happily ever after. That said, this also adds a different, more puritanical layer to our mentor hero. We're going to get to Dracula in all his transformed glory soon enough. But one of the things that we cannot deny about Hammer is how they ramped up the sex appeal in their films, particularly when it came to the vampire himself. The nuance of queerness that was present in Stoker's book and amplified in different ways in the Universal film is dampened down in the Hammer films through their use of Dracula's conquest of the women of the story, without Harker acting as the go-between. Even Christopher Lee would go on to describe the act of biting as being erotic, and compare it to a kind of surrender to his power. The sexual elements are not only overt, but deliberate, which then casts Van Helsing not only as a savior of the women's souls, but also their chastity. This role, if we are looking at it from this perspective, also has a kind of subtle but insidious underpinning to it. It is playing with a kind of chaste image that we get from Stoker's novel, but it also focuses its lens on the taboo of sexual desire in a different kind of way. Bram Stoker envisioned his Count as a cruel and strange degenerate of a man, and had this been the Dracula portrayed by Hammer, Van Helsing's job of reigning in female desires would have been dirt easy. Instead, he's the one to nanny the young lovers and keep the woman of the story from committing the sin of having the wrong kinds of desires. By all means, she's more than allowed to want and be committed to the young man of the story, but said man is never the hero that saves her or the day. He may assist, and in the end, he may be there to ride off with her, but it is only by Van Helsing's wisdom and ultimately his resistance to the power that Dracula holds that allows them to reach their happily ever after. Even then, for the young lovers, the nightmare may be over, but for Van Helsing, the war never ends, both in fiction and in popular culture. This is one of the biggest reasons that our lone vampire hunter is always positioned outside of any kind of romantic role, even when he's been aged down in the tale. Sometimes the adaptation works with this and casts him in a role that makes sense within the story, such as making him someone's actual father, and thus out of bounds for any romantic feelings. This was the case in the 1979 Frank Langella Dracula film, wherein Van Helsing was cast as an avenging father against Langella's seductive and sexually liberating count. This is also where Van Helsing's role is reduced from the puritanical patriarch of society at large and made to focus specifically on the women. 
It's true that he had this element to his character prior to this film, but this version of the character has no guiding role for the men, so much as he surges forth with his own agenda, and the others just follow. Sir Laurence Olivier's portrayal of the vampire hunter is much more personal and filled with rage as the vampire has preyed upon his daughter. This also somewhat changes his involvement in the story, however, as once she's dead, he's not out to save the other girls so much as he's out to kill the man who made his daughter into a vampire. This carries all the implications of a more relatable, but also an uglier version of this father bringing in the narrative of a man who destroys his own unclean, monstrous version of his daughter and sets out to destroy the person who defiled her. This angle doesn't exactly lend itself to the audience sympathizing with the old professor, and it inches him just a bit closer to that villainous role, as it strips him of the elements of his character that had previously excused away his monstrous behavior. Writer for Den of Geek, Tony Sokol, even goes so far as to say that Olivier's Dr. Van Helsing is the most evil Van Helsing in all of the Dracula movies. Now that's a bold statement, but one worth noting particularly if we're looking at this story with the same lens we've just discussed. While this version of the doomed woman, as I'll call her to avoid confusion, really does become a monster, she also becomes a strangely infantile one when she's seen by only the men. She calls out for her papa to join her, and while it's not seductive in the slightest, it is horrifying to see this woman utterly reduced to something more pitiful than it is terrifying. In being transformed by the vampire, Van Helsing's daughter is made into something of a ghoul, trapped in a kind of monstrous childhood from which she will never age out of. That said, when Van Helsing cuts her heart out of her body, she looks more like herself, and he does it in full view of everyone else, including Mina's counterpart. As Sokol pointed out, Van Helsing's logic is flawed and dimmed by something less than grief, judgment. It's not an accident that when the other woman of the story is present, the doomed woman that Van Helsing insists that he needs to remove the heart of looks lifelike because she doesn't see Lucy's counterpart as monstrous at all. It's only through his judgmental lens that she's become tainted and given into her monstrous appetites for sexual desires that he did not approve of, and it is by his judgment that she dies. Here we enter the area of the tale's history, where the noble hunter is now being cast as the obstacle to the young lovers. The difference is that this time, the lovers are Dracula and Mina's counterpart. This film switches the name of the two women, so just to make things less confusing, I'm diverting to the roles they play rather than naming them. But moving on, this brings up something that was only lightly hinted at before when we were dealing with Christopher Lee's Dracula. But in that case, the dangerous sexuality of the Count is still being rendered as the wrong choice. There's an orgasm in it for you, and for some women that's entirely the draw, but there's no love or tenderness. Here, the vampire is all lover, but his otherness is both repugnant and dangerous to the other men around him. He is offering not only tenderness, but also choice, and a kind of agency that Van Helsing, and basically all of the other men of the story, would deny her. As Dracula became a lover instead of a monster, Van Helsing was forced out of his role as the guide or protector of the innocent, and into the role of overbearing father figure or even outright villain. This was something we saw him as a few years before Langella hit the stage or the screen. In 1975, author Fred Saberhagen would create a counter-narrative to Stoker's Dracula, using much of the same dialogue that was recorded in the journals of that book to build on. While some people will claim that it doesn't count or that it's just an alternative history, I challenge this notion on account of the fact that, in looking at the familiar tale that we know by now, this still hits all those same beats that are present in a Dracula story. It is a retelling, sure, but it still tells the story of a man coming to see an undead count in regards to selling some property in England, said count coming to London, Lucy dying, the men coming together to kill the vampire, blah blah blah. The only real difference here is that Dracula is the one telling the story, and the true villains are portrayed as Renfield and Van Helsing. We're getting to the former of the two soon enough, 
But for Van Helsing, his role in this story is a reimagining of his role in the book, the fatherly element stripped away. Dracula is the one to tell us that Van Helsing was actually a charlatan, and it was his cruelty and negligence that led to the events of the novel. What's interesting about this point of view is not that the former villain was less than kind in his portrayal of his nemesis, though it should be noted that this version very much does take a page more from Universal and posits the two as opposites. Rather, that this version of the story recasts the good doctor from the bold practitioner of state-of-the-art scientific medical treatments to a reckless and dangerously inept man, engaging in practices that he neither fully understood nor cared that much about the toll it took on the patient. This, of course, plays specifically in how he treated Lucy by using the, as of Stoker's time, new development of blood transfusions. At the time when Stoker wrote the novel, medical practitioners still could not distinguish between blood types, and it had been a long-standing critique that if any one of the male donors had the wrong type, it would have done more harm than good to poor doomed Lucy. In the retelling of the story, Saberhagen is asking all the same questions the audience is, while also presenting the good doctor in a way that removes the excuse of his character being of his time. At no time did the men of the story question his guidance, and, in the highly likely scenario that he was wrong about the transfusions, he had more of a hand in killing the young girl than the original story admits. Saberhagen also strips the luster of Jack Seward's praise away from his professor, and reveals even more of how this man impressed upon the women of the story with his cures, and shines a light on how much they were made to endure the pains of his treatments while the male counterparts were able to sit back and just watch. Of course, Van Helsing couldn't stay that bad for very long, but never has quite recovered his kinder, fatherly presence in the narrative. Fast forwarding to the spectacle that was the 1992 costume epic of Coppola's Dracula, in this version, the vampire hunter has returned to the role of savior of souls, but he's hardly the man that Stoker intended. Anthony Hopkins does create a remarkable and memorable character that had taken on more of a scholarly angle than the Puritan of Cushing's portrayals in the Hammer days. Still, he has that somewhat uneasy edge to him that was present in Olivier's turn as the character. Hopkins' Van Helsing is quirky and just as tight-lipped as his narrative counterpart, but you don't feel that he's a guiding force for the powers of good, and just like Olivier, he plays direct obstacle to the romance between Dracula and Mina, more than even her husband. What's more, he also takes a note from the Dean and Balderston version, wherein he creates a subtle sense of war between the hunter and the vampire. Coppola added the historic dimension to Dracula's character, but included this layer in his treatment of Van Helsing. In this version of events, Van Helsing was present when Dracula turned his back on the church in the form of a priest denying a proper burial to the warlord's bride. When they meet again, the professor behaves as though he's been studying Dracula for many years, adding the sense that this is an old nemesis that he's finally going to take down. This is all implication, I will add, as it's never overtly confirmed or denied, but the suggestion goes a long way. Van Helsing is there to represent the triumph of God over the darkness, but he is no longer the idealized version of the protector, and as such, the last blow that ends the vampire's reign goes instead to Mina. And before we take our leave of our vampire nemesis, we have to address at least one portrayal, where the good doctor was not so much a doctor or a professor, but a warrior for the church, for better or worse. There are many other portrayals of this character that stick out, but none so sorely as this one, wherein the filmmakers decided to rebrand the character not only solidly in the role of the hero again, but also, for the first time ever, attempted romantic lead. This, of course, would be from the 2004 film Van Helsing, starring Hugh Jackman and directed by Stephen Summers. The reviews of this film are a bit all over the place, with some of the more charitable citing a bit of style over substance, and others declaring the whole thing a hot mess right from start to finish. Regardless of where one sits on this spectrum, however, there are two things to take into account here. For one, 
the title and its shift to focus on a completely different character than it normally would. This was a bold move, but ultimately flattened the character out. Van Helsing throughout his entire existence up to that point had been secondary to Dracula. Since Stoker's days, he'd been elevated to standing level with the vampire, but he'd never overtaken him. This was the first time that the hunter was the star and made into a leading man with his nemesis sitting sidecar. But it robs the story of the real fight between the two figures. If Dracula's name is on the front of the film, you are always left to wonder if Van Helsing truly did succeed this time. But when it's the hunter who has top billing, the audience had its answer before they even entered the theater. There was also the little issue of making the fatherly, wise professor into a much younger, much more sexually available hunter. In theory, anyway. In this version of the character, Van Helsing is someone who had come to the Vatican with no memory of who he was or where he came from. The plot allows him to be a blank slate for the sexy female lead to play off of, but never quite get close enough to touch. The romance between the two is stunted and finally denied entirely by killing off the female character, but even if she'd survived, the film would never have allowed them to come together anyway. Van Helsing, it is revealed, is actually the Angel Gabriel, which plays a whole new angle in the denial of the hunter's ability to love. Of course, in this version, as an angel in human form, He's also not allowed to have any problematic scenes wherein he convinces the others to hammer a stake through a young girl's body or cuts off the head of female vampires. His goodness is ensured, and the vampires are absolute evil for the sake of evil, making it okay to kill them without the reservation that anyone might otherwise feel. While there are those who enjoyed this portrayal, it certainly isn't a lasting one in the eyes of pop culture. Dracula fans have long accepted that this figure, when he makes it into our tale at all, is playing the counterbalance to the vampire. If Dracula is all that is evil in the world, he must be the bitter-tinged embodiment of goodness and light. If the vampire is playing undead lover, he is the one to ruin the fun through his adherence to patriarchal ideas or wants for revenge. And more importantly, in the most memorable and still lauded portrayals throughout his film career, Van Helsing should usually be the one to deliver the final end to the monster. It's only polite to let the two diametrically opposing forces see it out to the end. That said, Van Helsing isn't the only one with a strange relationship to Dracula throughout the decades. In fact, his connection to the vampire sometimes is threatened by the little character that Stoker created, but most people forgot. Mr. R. N. Renfield. This is a unique character in this tale because, depending on what version of the story you favor, he's either a major player or completely absent from the whole thing. We did get a little bit of a peek at Renfield prior to this, first as a footnote in Stoker's book, and later, when we have a look at his first major change in Nosferatu. That version is among the more important ones for looking at how this character developed, not only because he was finally given something to do, but also because it was the first time that the madman was given an overt link to the vampire. We already established in the last episode that this was where he threw in his hat with the evil crowd, but the events of that story are actually framed as being just as much his fault as they are Orlok's. In some ways, this is the worst version of Renfield, as he's shown as having just as much, if not a little more, power as the vampire. Orlok might have had the intention on coming to Visburg, but it was Renfield's counterpart that facilitated his arrival. He is the only one who knows where the plague came from, gleefully assisting where he can, and as mentioned before, even tries to stop the vampire's destruction. What's interesting about this is that, much like the vampire he was now tethered to, this was probably as monstrous as he would be allowed to get in pop culture for years to come. The next major shift marked a bit more of a vampiric turn for Renfield, as he sucked all of the first part of the story away from Jonathan Harker's character in the Universal adaptations. Both the English and the Spanish versions placed the future lunatic in the role of solicitor who came to Transylvania to complete the sale of Carfax. Gone is the long enforced stay in the castle, 
But in its place, Renfield is, like his Nosferatu counterpart, cast into a frenzied loyalty and is charged with facilitating his new master's journey to England. Obviously, this was partially a practical move, as it helped to consolidate the character into the cast in a way that he'd never been in Stoker's novel. That said, it also had the effect of transferring the constant thread of intimacy between Dracula and Jonathan onto this new version of Renfield. The results actually add a new layer of cruelty to the vampire for this version. After all, in the Universal films, he actually does lay a hand on the solicitor, sending away his brides so that he can take advantage of the drugged man himself. And for his part, Renfield is changed by the encounter, torn between his overwhelming loyalty to his master and his alienation from the world that sees him as divergent from acceptable society. It's not hard to see how codified Renfield's role in both these films is. Both Dwight Fry and his Spanish counterpart, Pablo Alvarez Rubio, played the part as deeply conflicted, wanting to help the main characters, but still being absolutely drawn to and committed to Dracula. The end result is that the character comes to realize that he's been replaced by one of the women, and amid his declarations of loyalty and service to the charismatic man who made him what he is, he's killed with no one to mourn him on either side. Renfield's character is given a slight bit of reprieve in the Spanish version, in the form of Van Helsing giving him last rites over his broken body, but he is still cast from society in the end. This version of Renfield plays out at its most tragic, and wouldn't be revised quite in this capacity again until Coppola got a hold of the character. But even then, it wasn't so openly hostile to the character as this. Renfield's curious and abject cravings were the direct result of his encounter with Dracula, a man who had sought to make him into this lunatic. The vampire partakes of his body, but when his pet madman becomes less useful to him, he allows him to be taken into an asylum. Here, Renfield is treated as a blight on society, and his erratic behavior swings from agony to shame to manic devotion. He clings to the life, or lives, he was promised until he sees Dracula carrying a helpless Mina on the stairs. This final confrontation wherein he begs for acknowledgement of his adorations and finally for his life ends in his death. While these portrayals certainly lend themselves well to queer readings, one of the main ways that we can look to analyze the 1931 Renfields, as I'll call them, is to compare them to their reflection in a movie made many years later. In general, I've omitted looking at parodies, not only for time, but also for the fact that the stories themselves are usually meant to be skewed to a certain perspective. A parody points out all the eccentricities of any story it mocks, and when done well, is less about telling the story than lovingly critiquing it. Whether anyone wants to say that Dracula Dead and Loving It is a well-done parody might be in dispute. But one can't deny that Peter McNichol did a spot-on impression of Dwight Fry's Madman. The one thing he was missing was the subtext of the 1931 films. This version of the character has the lunatic remade as a strictly heterosexual but excessively weak-willed man who is less connected to Dracula than he is just performing strange antics. He mimes the Victorian horror of being attacked by the vampire women, but the film even shows him enjoying their presence and putting up basically no resistance to it. Even his slavish devotion to the vampire is inconsequential to the plot, as he immediately transfers his loyalty to Dr. Seward as soon as Dracula is dead. The removal of any kind of implication of queer leanings to the character in McNichols' Renfield serves to highlight how interwoven it was in the original films. The 1931 Renfields were completely consumed with their masters, and had little to no interaction with the women of the narrative at all. The Spanish version of the character even goes so far as to mime like he's going to attack a maid that had fainted, only to ignore her prone body in favor of an insect that he wanted to eat instead. Both the 1931 Renfields have a scene where they see their master with their chosen women, but Fry's portrayal includes him looking on in horror that could almost be read as heartbreak. This scene plays out in a way where the audience is left to decide whether the poor man is beside himself over what he's facilitated, or that he's been replaced. 
This was a difficult character for filmmakers to reconcile, evidently, as Renfield went on a bit of a vacation during the Hammer years. It's not entirely surprising, either, as Renfield had become a bit of a stand-in for Jonathan Harker, who had also managed to make his way to the sidelines thanks to Dean Balderston. Jonathan's spirit in the tale would be carried through as he was the acceptable and correct choice of lover against Christopher Lee's count, but even then, sometimes Harker was still killed off by Hammer, and there was no use in carrying the madman over if they weren't going to use the asylum part of the plot. Part of this might be because filmmakers didn't quite know what to do with this character. After all, Stoker's original version was ill-used at best, and the lunatic angle didn't even exist in the Turkish or Icelandic versions, even though Seward's asylum did make an appearance. In Nosferatu, he was finally given a task, and we can't deny that his role was rooted in a xenophobic portrayal of the character who was actually played by a Jewish actor. It was only in the Universal films that this character was granted a personality, and though it was lifted from Jonathan Harker's prototype, he ended up with different motivations and feelings on the matter. After all, it wasn't like Harker was possessed of a slavish, almost ravenous, loving devotion to the Count after his stay. So what to do with Renfield if you take that out of his character? Therein lies probably the biggest obstacle for writers and directors in bringing this character to life. His journey through film has taken the character out of this tale for a time, but given him a new element that better reflects his otherness. Without this facet, he ended up being in different roles, but the story always demands that he be latched to the vampire. Sometimes, he's just straight up criminally insane, such as his portrayal in Saberhagen's Dracula tapes. In this version, he's a pervert and a would-be rapist who pleads with the Count to give him power, particularly over women. His desires for lives are rooted less in the want to prolong his own, though that definitely is a side benefit. By contrast, the Renfield of the Langella version of Dracula is a truth-teller and becomes yet another tragic figure. This version, played by Tony Haygarth, acts as a kind of director for the audience. Renfield first exposes the viewer to the fact that this version of Jonathan Harker is a bit of a charlatan and a lot of a jerk. He tells us through scant dialogue that Harker roped in the sale from the well-to-do count out from under Renfield and berates the solicitor for selling him Carfax, knowing full well that the house was in complete disrepair and adjoined an active insane asylum. We see him expose for us the reality of the slippery and flawed man that had once been our hero. That doesn't stop him from trying to warn everyone that what he finds in Dracula is somewhat more monstrous than a cheating lawyer. Of course, he isn't listened to in either case, and it has little to do with his mental state. Hagar's Renfield has a marked working class accent, perfectly beneath the notice or concern of the upper class family that the story centers on. Even Dracula himself carries that same class bias, though he is a foreigner himself, which makes him an outsider as well. But no one cares about that initially, as he understands the ways and the notions of society. Renfield can't speak to the rest of the people of the story like he belongs, even though he was born there. And as a result, his warnings and pleas fall on deaf ears. He is rewarded for his truth-telling by getting locked up as an inmate and eventually killed by Dracula for a betrayal that didn't do him any good anyway. There is one more Renfield of note, and that is, of course, Tom Waits' portrayal in Coppola's version. This take on the character is possibly the most unfortunate, as it seems like more of an easter egg than a well-developed character. In this story, Renfield was the one to go to Transylvania first, being driven insane by his journey and being locked up upon his return. He plays almost like a kind of composite sketch of the others that came before him. He's not Dwight Fry, but he is also not the insane villain. He's not a good character, but he's also not evil either. In the end, perhaps he is the closest to Stoker's original, as he is kind of left somewhat unused. That said, in looking at this portrayal and the different versions that we've highlighted, it's clear that Renfield is something of a wild card in this story. 
He is a strange element to the tale that always circles around the Count, usually as a slave. His devotion is not like that of other assistant or slave archetypes like Igor to Frankenstein or to any other mad doctor. Like Van Helsing has become, he is intrinsically tied to the vampire, but unlike the hunter, it is entirely because of his otherness that he can never be freed of it. Stoker started it with his introduction, but the tale, as we've seen, took whatever it needed to make this character work within its time frame and made Renfield into someone either to be feared, reviled, or pitied. In Nosferatu, it was the assumed evils of his heritage that marked him as a villain and linked him with the terrible monster that plagued Visburg. In Universal, it was his queer leanings that brought about his spiritual and mental anguish and ended in his abandonment and death. In Saberhagen's novel, Renfield's outsider status started as a criminal madness that focused on his sexual deviancy. In the Langella Dracula, it was his class that set him outside of the norm and allowed him to be ignored and killed. And again, though it was a spoof on the Dwight Fry portrayal, we can't ignore that the one and only time that Renfield has been on screen and lived to see the end credits was when his otherness turned out to be that he wasn't anything more than an idiot. But now that we're done talking about the supporting cast, let's get to the man of the hour. By now you've noted that we've talked about Dracula mostly in passing, and a big part of that is based on the fact that in most versions of his tale, the Count arrives late and never overstays his welcome in any story he's in. Obviously, this changed in a lot of ways over the years, which is something that we'll be getting to right away here. But one of the traits that we know Dracula for is his presence in the narrative, usually well before he's even introduced. Most of this stems directly back to the source, with Stoker building up our impression of him through Jonathan Harker's journals. But even in the age of film, more often than not, Dracula likes to make his appearance only after the stage has been primed for his arrival. We almost never see his face until he's ready for his close-up, and even then, his fangs stay hidden until much later. And speaking of fangs, let's talk about how his have changed over the decades since his debut. When I say fangs, I assure you that I'm not going to wax poetic about teeth, as the only real difference between them all is poor Orlock and his unfortunate overbite. That said, our rat-like Nosferatu was the first to show his fangs, and the first one of his vampiric brethren to actually be shown biting someone. Granted, Bruno didn't actually show the wounds, but he didn't have to. He showed the vampire's hideous face entering the room, and his long, ominous shadow closing its hand over a girl's heart. The vampire's fangs were also visible, making sure you knew exactly what was going to happen to you if you woke up with him in the room. There was no denying what he was just to look at him, not quite the same as when we saw Christopher Lee show off his fangs. Until Hammer came along, thanks to the Hayes Code in Hollywood, our vampire couldn't be anything but a well-dressed creature of the night who could skillfully cover his victims in a cape in lieu of any neck biting. His attack on Mina and the act of opening a wound in his chest was far too sexual, so Universal compromised by letting a weeping actress explain in either English or Spanish, whichever you prefer, that the Count politely opened a vein in his arm and made her drink from that instead. Much better. The lack of blood and biting would carry over into the Ottoman world, where Dracula would be next depicted in 1953, in their silent adaptation of the Turkish novel Dracula in Istanbul. This stands as both one of the more accurate depictions of Stoker's novel and one of the most divergent at the same time. For those who might have forgotten or hadn't listened to the previous episodes where we had a look at the Turkish bootleg version of the story, Dracula in Istanbul was essentially Stoker's story redressed to fit a different audience, and in many cases, was almost identical to Brahms' version. It's entirely possible that only because it was unknown by the English-speaking world until long after Dracula had passed into public domain that accounts for its similarities to that first book. If we recall, 
The official versions of the play, that were later turned into the movie, were forced to go through Florence Stoker's approval, rather than going directly back to the source. With the Turkish film, they could work from their own novel version directly, and because they hadn't developed a play to get in the way, they didn't feel the need to cut the beginning. This version of Dracula still has a bit more in common with Count Orlok than with Lugosi's version of the vampire. His big showdown is not with the Van Helsing equivalent, but rather, he's seduced and trapped by the dancing showgirl, who also happens to be the wife of the young solicitor he's held captive. That's only one of the choices that deviates from Stoker's story. One of the curious parts of this adaptation is the way that it highlights how easily the earlier versions of Dracula integrated into a modern world. This becomes more clear in this version, as the latest technology of the day has been upgraded from the telegraph and blood transfusion to phones and cars and electricity. Because this version was a bit closer to the novel than most adaptations, and it was also a silent film, Dracula's participation in the film is a bit more sparse. This version does have two things that are of note, however, and it's worth it to highlight these elements because it shows the trajectory that Dracula was on, even outside of Hollywood. It would be a bit of a stretch to believe that the Universal adaptation hadn't made its way to Turkey, as the film does take some notes in its setting and certain other plot beats from those movies. That said, among the most important things that it took was the transformation of the vampire from the pure monster that he was in Nosferatu to the gentleman vampire in evening wear. This version of the Count is not quite as appealing as Lugosi, but he knew his way around human interaction, and understood the need to keep his vampire fangs well concealed. Though he spends most of his time moving through the shadows, when he does arrive in Istanbul, he's eloquent in his speech, and his mannerisms are still that of a man rather than a monster. Something else this version of Dracula takes cues from is the heterosexual view of the Count. Even though most of the men, save Renfield, are represented in this story, Dracula's interest focuses almost exclusively on the women, with Mina's counterpart enticing him with a seductive dance that ends in his downfall. We can see shades of both Nosferatu and the Universal films in this adaptation, but used in a way that grants us the best of both worlds. The vampire is still on a conquest to return to Turkey, but his defeat is at the hands of a woman that he ultimately desired more than anything else. And in the end, she swoons, but apparently the Turkish adaptations saw no reason to end everything on a tragic note for the young lovers. Dracula, the nightmare from the past, was felled, and order was restored to live happily ever after. At least until the Count found a different English home to get comfortable in. Throughout most of the 50s and 60s, the name Dracula belonged to only one man. While Lugosi had made the name iconic, being the first in America to bring the Count to screen, and the very first to utter the words, I am Dracula, Christopher Lee was the one to bring longevity to the role. In his tenure with Hammer, Lee would don the cape every time they featured the Count, with the exception of the last time in 1974's Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. Overall, Lee played the vampire a total of seven times, the first in 1958, and his final turn with the Fangs in 1973. We've talked earlier about how this version of Dracula was presented as a much sexier villain than a monster, and with no Harker to act as the target and no Renfield to offer his slavish love and devotion, the vampire was all about the women. That said, it wasn't simply the women we had come to know. This is where our New Age fairy tale breaks down a bit in structure. Dracula is still a powerful figure that represents anxieties around wrong or forbidden types of sexual desire, but his story becomes more stripped of its nuance as his supporting cast begins to disappear. The first Hammer film does have Jonathan Harker in it, but his role is inconsequential and ends in failure and death. There is no tension between the two men or even any attempt to explore anything between them, as Dracula entombs him and makes his way to English soil. 
The rest of the story is familiar, but missing most of the extra players, elevating the rivalry between Van Helsing and Dracula, and creating the polarity that we know now. If we think about the way in which the vampire had been previously framed as an outsider, his main goal being one of conquest and the spread of his influence, the rest of the cast had been somewhat more essential in crushing his advance before it began. Now, through the shedding of some previous skins and a few transformations, Dracula was a figure that had always been and would surface again without careful mitigation and a kind of father-knows-best mentality. The tale is telling the same story in most respects, but it is changed to put the puritanical message forward and making Dracula into a kind of monster for whom the main danger is the ruin of women. By turn, the women were made to be powerless against him, transforming him from a stealthy predator into a more magnetic figure within the narrative. This is an important shift because it signals the vampire rising from the shadows to claim his place. The stage plays and universal adaptations had primed the stage for this, including more of the Count and giving him direct dialogue that he could perform on his own. In that sense, he'd always been the star, but Lee's Dracula had even more of a presence in these stories, and this meant we got to see more of what the vampire would come to do best. Because Hammer operated out of England instead of America, it stood well outside the reach of the Hayes Code, which meant that not only could the Count now openly seduce as many buxom women as he wanted, he could give audiences a look at those bloodied up fangs of his. He was still being presented as the wrong choice sexually, but he was now an openly sexual being, the likes of which would prompt calls to lock up your daughters and your wives. At this point, the vampire was on a path that would never take him back to being Orlok, as far as Dracula was concerned, and whatever monster Stoker had conceived of was long gone. The Count had shed his queer leanings at this point, and turned his attention to a whole new kind of conquest that catered entirely to the ladies of the audience. It's unreasonable to think that vampires will ever entirely embody a heteronormative ideal. But the Count is a rare exception to this, as he hasn't had any kind of bond to a male character other than Renfield since the days of the Universal films. Even then, it's very clear that the connection between Renfield and Dracula is entirely one-sided, but it also showcases the callous dismissal of any kind of care or devotion that anyone else has for him. This would be the norm for a time, but instead of Renfield, he had his fangs set on the women of the story usually as a corrupting force that brings out their low-cut dresses and lust for blood. Basically, all of Lee's portrayals are set up as a battleground for the sexual ownership of the female stars of the film. His conquest would never again go back to things like money or banal ideas of power, unless it was world domination. But by the end of the 60s, his quest had become more personal to him than before. As such, his monstrous nature was regressing even further to accommodate a vampire that was in dire need of something more important than blood. Dressed in his finest evening wear, Dracula was ready to become a leading man, and as we entered the 70s, the Count was going to welcome himself to the world of the fairy tale proper. In the decade of bell bottoms and recipes that might put you off eating food altogether, Dracula got a bit more elegant in his mannerisms, and his image got a lot easier on the eyes. Of course, Christopher Lee was a striking man, and Bella Lugosi had no shortage of female fans that sent him letters throughout his entire career. But they were cast as the alluring monster who would take rather than ask. The vampire for the New Age was less interested in a silent bride than he was a woman who could speak her mind about what she wanted. And she wasn't looking for a monster so the Count had to adapt to life in society, though what society meant had become a lot more malleable since Stoker's time. By this time, the story had gotten to the point where it was officially old, and filmmakers had to make a decision on whether they were doing a period piece, complete with the cost that that would require, or setting up for a more modern take on the tale. This was something that had been more flexible to the story right from the beginning, because Stoker had been the one to create something that was of his time, 
but also factored in his enthusiasm for things like the latest technology in medicine or travel. In 1972, while Hammer was still struggling to make Christopher Lee's Dracula retain the scare factor in their stories, set in castles far away in times of peasants and religious dogma, there was another film that came out that featured a strong-willed and romantic vampire as its lead. While the film Blackula might be written off as a cheap B-movie and more in the black exploitation genre than horror, there is merit to looking at how this version of Dracula was a part of the evolution that brought this figure from monster to main love interest. While most lists give the title of the romantic version of the Count to Frank Langella, it's worth it to remember that this film was using that trope a full seven years before that, and three years before Saberhagen published the Dracula tapes. This was also the first film to include the trope of the reincarnated bride. I will concede that this is a departure from our regular version of The Count, and doesn't include the same story beats as our previous films, but I'll also argue that Blackula is just as important as his white counterparts. For one, he brought a version of the tale to an audience that had been previously excluded from any incarnation of the vampire. What's more, he wasn't simply a black version of a white character, or a character that catered to a white view of black people. The film was called Blackula as a means to connect it to the familiar story, and while this character is called that exactly once in the entire movie, he is otherwise addressed by his real name, Mama Walde. There's also something to be said about what this character is expressing in terms of how it highlighted certain realities and anxieties in a black community. Rather than take the narrative away from the titular character and build the action around him, this story makes him the central focus. This tale is about how Prince Mama Walde came to Transylvania to meet with Count Dracula in regards to the slave trade. Initially, he is presented as a strong, powerful, and dignified leader, but his attempt to negotiate is met with mockery and then aggression, something many in the black community were already well acquainted with by 1972. Dracula then turns Mama Walde into a vampire, and entombs him while locking his beloved wife in the room where he's kept so he can hear as she slowly dies of starvation. The story then fast-forwards to modern day, for the 70s, and features the rise of the vampire prince after the tomb that he's been shut in has been purchased by a couple of antique dealers. For his part, Dracula has been assumed vanquished, but the power that he gave to Mama Walde remains. Sustained all these years after killing off the two antiques dealers and a random cab driver, the prince looks to reconnect with the woman he lost so many years ago. When he does find her, his actions are kind, respectful, and tender in a way that Lee or Lugosi had never been. And for her part, his reincarnated bride is not coaxed into his embrace through mesmerism or overwhelming lust, but trust. Her fear only subsides when Mama Walde makes himself known to her, and only after he asks for her permission to stay in her presence does he become her lover. What's more, he doesn't transform her through his bite without consent, either. Their intimate moments are not represented as a euphemism in the film for sex, but an act of marriage. The vampire as a lover showcases that his only interest is in getting his wife back into his arms, as there are no conquests otherwise. That doesn't mean he's not a monster, but his antics are far more random and less calculated and evil than they would otherwise be. While Dracula proper has, up to this point, had his sights set on the taking of the West either through plague, political powers, or the corruption of their women, Mama Walde is only really concerned with getting that which he loves back. That said, there are problematic elements that crop up along the way. For one, as this was filmed in the 70s, there are some particularly ugly depictions of certain people, not the least of which were the two very obviously gay antique stealers. Their deaths were needlessly gruesome, but they also reinforce the very clear message that Dracula, in whatever form he may be in, was absolutely adhering to the heteronormative standards of masculinity. For as tender and loving as he may be, there was to be no intimacy between him and any of the other men, 
and those who were engaged in such acts were going to be treated to pain and death. That said, this was hardly the first film to start reinforcing that trope, and as we've already discussed, while Lugosi's Dracula did make contact with Renfield, Lee's vampire had never once had any kind of encounter with the men of the story that wasn't part of a fight to the death. The trope would get carried out further by the films to follow it, so even if this movie is an outlier in the world of Dracula adaptations, it carries much of the same baggage the rest of them do. While I can't speak to how well this film captures the anxieties of black communities within its time, it is worth noting that Blackula was made by filmmakers that were actually part of that community, and would have been able to authentically capture the realities of their experience better than anyone else. There are also some realities that they've included that still speak to what activists are trying to change now, such as the lack of attention paid by predominantly white police forces when the victims come from those black communities. For a brief but well-written breakdown of what Blackula accomplishes as a film and what its flaws are in the eyes of someone who is black, I have included a link in the show notes to an article from Kivelis Matthews Alvarado, guest writing for Haunted Home Room, which I highly suggest you check out. For our purposes, however, I do want to swing the focus onto another change that this film introduced, and, for the most part, is one of very few, if not the only one under the Dracula umbrella, to feature this unique death scene. In other vampire narratives, the bold choice to destroy themselves is one that isn't unheard of, and even in Stoker's time, Varney had decided that death by volcano was a better alternative to continuing on in Penny Dreadful Land. This has never been something associated with Dracula, however. In most iterations of the character, he has that bold, confident presence that could never allow for him to ever admit defeat. As time moved on, there was also the issue of Van Helsing to contend with. Audiences had come to expect a showdown between the two opposing narrative forces, and Hammer wasn't about to deny them on anything that made money. Mama Walde, on the other hand, was very different in how he approached his power and presence, and so his death should not be one that followed the other white Draculas. When his plans had been thwarted and his love taken from him, it is the prince himself who decides his own fate. He could have easily killed the men in front of him, but didn't care to without his lover. Instead, of his own accord, he walks into the sun and dies by his own hand, denying any authority, white or otherwise, to decide for him. The result is tragic, as those who had opposed the vampire are left feeling that sense of loss rather than relief. The audience, too, had been given a look at the story from Mama Walde's point of view rather than his pursuers, making them feel the depth of his grief and the sadness of his sacrifice. Again, I don't feel like I can speak for a community that I don't belong to, but it is worth noting that, with some exceptions, most variations on the Dracula story end on a much happier note, and few leave the audience feeling such a profound sense of loss when the vampire dies. Those that do, there is some sense that though the vampire is now gone, he isn't really necessarily going to stay that way. And while Mama Walde did eventually rise again, the ending to this first film had not intended to bring him back, and there was no sense of peace or heavenly restoration after the fact. But for that, we're going to have to forge ahead. Mama Walde set a precedent for the Dracula of the new decade, Sure, Christopher Lee had one more film in him with Hammer, before moving on to better things, but that kind of depiction had gotten stale. Besides, by now Dracula had been allowed to talk for a while, and it was time to give him something to say. That was the entire idea behind the Dracula tapes. Unlike Universal or Hammer, wherein writers treated the concept of the Dracula tale like it was something they could stretch over the bones of whatever story they were trying to tell, Saberhagen went right back to Stoker for his version, using direct quotes from his novel, but interspersing them with accounts from the vampire. And this vampire had much to say about why he was in England, and what he found there. Where Mama Walde was more of an incidental fish-out-of-water story, 
setting the vampire up in the modern world after being forced into the past for so long, Saberhagen's Dracula is telling an immigrant story. To distinguish him from the rest of the Draculas we've been looking at, I'll call him by the name that the author uses, which again links him historically to the warlord. Vlad, as he prefers in the narrative, reframes his encounters with the familiar characters, following the tale as we know it to the letter, but telling it anew. Much of his accounts are in defense of his actions, retelling his version as someone who wasn't privy to what conclusions were being drawn about him. This Count, you see, is a dreamer, his goal being to come into the new world and integrate himself among human beings enough that they would grow accustomed to him enough to accept him. He recognizes that he is a foreigner, both in the way that he talks as well as his vampiric nature, and much of his story is about his failure to recognize the nuances and unspoken rules of English society. When it comes to what Stoker had depicted as brutal attacks on the women, Vlad again changes the narrative from the dangerous and barbaric outsider to misunderstanding and tragedy. His version of the encounters with Lucy show a more casual but consenting affair, recasting her as being bored with the prudishness and rigidity of Victorian life. Though he makes it clear that he wasn't really in love with her, and saw their liaisons as just a bit of a fun distraction for both of them. He also points out that it was only because of what Van Helsing had done with his botched blood transfusions that he ended up turning the young girl into a vampire at all. Of course, this puts the horror of her death entirely back into the hands of the crew of light, and only adds to the pathos we feel for Vlad as he's hunted down for the crime of wanting to be accepted and helping a girl in need. He didn't help his case by falling in love with Mina. Again, his relationship with her is depicted as one of consent and affection, including the infamous scene where she drinks from the cut in his chest. That, of course, is the last straw for those who were rallying against him, and the Count was forced out of the country, eventually attacked, and presumed dead. This story then takes the theory that the Count just used his transformative powers to become dust and retreat to safety from the xenophobic mob that had driven him away yet again. By now, the heroes of Stoker's book had all gotten turned into villains, but his Count hadn't entirely made the change to the undisputed leading man in film. That changed entirely when Frank Langella donned the cape. It's true that Mama Walde came first, bringing a kind of sophistication and romantic angle to the Count. But he still had his monstrous moments. Saberhagen turned Count Dracula into plain old Vlad, who was a full-on misunderstood and virtuous lovelorn hero. The 1979 film by John Badham accomplished something that both those adaptations had set up for, but hadn't quite taken the path of yet. This version of Dracula made his full transition into what's known as a beastly bridegroom, as noted by my friend and folklore scholar Lily Golcheva, whose name I butchered last time I brought her up, so thank you Lily, I am super sorry. When we first meet Dracula, we don't even see him in human form, but rather that of the wolf. It's only once he's found by the doomed woman that we see his hand emerge from the sleeve of his fur-lined coat. Prior to this, the Lucy and Mina characters had been presented as mirror opposites, but not in the way they normally are. Again, to avoid confusion, we're not using their film names here because they mucked those up for really no reason. The two girls are no longer depicted in the Madonna horror pairing, but rather a more modern set of ideals. Mina's counterpart is bold, confident, and smart, but also willful and unafraid to challenge the men around her. She refuses to go along with what they want and actively works against them sometimes, especially when she decides that she wants to be with Dracula. The doomed woman, on the other hand, is sickly and meek, sleeping with her father's picture upon her bedside table like a constant guardian. If you're not up to date on your fairy tales as of recently, these two women are presenting the two sides of the heroine of the older versions of Beauty and the Beast. On one hand, she is a woman who's verging on breaking out into the world and seeing more than just what childhood had allowed. But on the other hand, 
She is held in her place by the wants and needs of her father, until Daddy Dearest comes to the attention of the titular beast. From here, the daughter goes of her own free will to be with the beastly bridegroom, eventually winning over the man within him, and through the power of love, both she and the beast are freed. When the doomed woman is approached by Dracula, she invites his presence, openly presenting her neck to him. When Mina's counterpart accepts his dinner invitation, she states directly that she is in his castle of her own accord. This shift officially marks where the narrative switches from the male-oriented story that Stoker had conceived to a more female-centered one. This film still tells the story more from the male perspective, focusing more on their characters than the women. But because Dracula has more of an interest in romancing them, and the other male characters are uniquely obsessed with keeping their feminine desires at bay, they play a much larger part than they did before. And because the vampire is now being presented as the dashing romantic lover, come to deliver you from father's ideas of sex and marriage through his technicolor lovemaking scene, it really drives home how brutal and horrific the other men's actions are to the doomed woman. Nothing that Dracula does to these women can be made to look worse than what the human men do, and even when they are on their quest to take Mina's counterpart away from the vampire, there are no declarations of love and relief on their part when they succeed. At one point, when she gets in the way of his attack on Dracula, Jonathan Harker is even shown striking his fiancée because the need to kill the intruding man is more important than the woman he says he loves. As always happens, eventually the vampire is defeated, but in this version, the woman he leaves behind is now changed. While the monster of the beastly bridegroom is gone, for now, there's a hint he still won in the end, as his bride watches with a smile as his cape catches on the wind and flies away into the distance. And after all, in the end, he was still the one that was chosen above the wants of her father figure, or any other imposing male of the story. While there were other Dracula stories throughout the 80s in different media, for the most part, the King of the Vampires was allowed a bit of a break through the decade of big hair and spandex. The next truly big splash back into pop culture our count would make was in 1992's costume drama that has loomed almost as large as Lugosi over the tale, and for good reason. Hyped as being a look back at Bram Stoker's story, though it absolutely isn't, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula is not only the natural progression of the tale that we've watched unfold throughout the decades, but also a loving culmination of them. As David J. Skull has been quoted as saying before, this film often confuses people as to how faithful it is to the book because it has the author's name emblazoned in the title. But if you've met even one vampire fan who's read the book before, you likely already know that this is far from the case. And the changes are pretty easy to see immediately upon watching the film, because the focus now has entirely changed from being a story about the anxieties of men to being one about the desires of women. The opening scene is already a huge tell as to what's going on with this story, as we're greeted not by Jonathan Harker, but by Dracula himself. The story links him to the historical warlord, and begins with him leaving a weeping bride to tend to his killing fields. Outfitted in jackal armor, the image only solidifies his role as the beastly bridegroom, but his behavior to come is really what tells us who this story is about and for. Upon the discovery that his beloved wife has died by suicide, and the church that he fought to protect will not honor her life, Dracula is so overwhelmed with grief and rage that he takes aim at God himself, and for his sins, he becomes the immortal Count. This beginning reframes the story entirely, picking up the threads of what the Langella Dracula had only really hinted at. That said, in order to accommodate those changes, the story had to take the lens away from the hunters, and even Dracula himself and give it to the one person who, up to that point, hadn't really gotten much of a say in this tale. I will point out that it's true that Mina was one of the main characters of the book, but as we've looked at before, most of the elements of her character show her as being fastened to the crew of light, and especially to her husband. 
She does show that she is capable of thinking, and is often praised for her ability to figure things out, but more often than not, she's adhering to that Victorian ideal that a woman engages in self-improvement not for her own sake or enjoyment, but for the betterment of others. As such, her character really is entrenched in doing the right thing for the greater good, and in Stoker's hands, she even went so far as to surrender her fate to them giving her blessing that, if she should become a vampire, they were welcome to kill her as violently as they did Lucy. That is not the case in Coppola's version. Taking a page from the Blackula story, this time Mina is not simply a woman who can be used as a convenient way to torment Jonathan Harker, or even just a random encounter that draws in the vampire's interest through her wit or beauty. Being the reincarnated lover, the audience is automatically drawn to the tension between the two as their stories draw them closer together. The beginning paints for us the picture of the creepy, uncomfortable Count that we knew from the book, but as he draws closer to the woman he loves, he becomes less of the beast and more of the loving man beneath. To accomplish this change in a way that makes sense, as mentioned, the story is almost entirely handed over to Mina. With the exception of the beginning where we see Jonathan's journey to meet the Count, the focus is on the women of the story and what they want. When we meet Mina, one of her first conversations with Lucy shows her playing the role of good Victorian woman who's disgusted by the idea of sex, but it is implied that she is disappointed by her lack of intimacy with her fiancé. She also shows a certain amount of longing when she sees how openly her society friend flirts with the three men who come to call for her. Her desires are safely locked up and kept at bay until she meets the Count. And only then do we see her basking in the attention that he provides. She is transformed into a much more sensual woman, freed from the normal propriety of her role, and eventually she makes the choice to partake of what Dracula offers. Likewise, our monster is also transformed. While Gary Oldman's Count is genuinely unsettling at the beginning, and he is still monstrous when he arrives in England, when he finally encounters Mina, he becomes the one to accommodate her, even as he's pursuing her. When we talked about Lucy as the monster prior, we established that one of the things that made her so frightening to the men of the Victorian period was that she was not simply wasting way into the idealized corpse, but that she was demanding. She was the one to be taking their blood, and when confronted as a vampire, she was also the one to demand Arthur's affections. By contrast, this version of the Count is aware from the beginning that he is handing those keys to Mina. He has the power to take her and the will to want to, but unlike with Lucy, he chooses not to. She sets the tone of their encounters, and he only moves forward once he has been given permission. What's more, he proves to her that she's in control through their interaction with the wolf in the theater. When she pets the animal, it's Dracula's way to show that through her, the beastly bridegroom is tamed and her encounters with him can be both safe and pleasurable. Speaking of, we should probably take a moment here to talk about one of the reasons that this rendition of Dracula looms so large over pop culture, and why it has, for some, overtaken the narrative of the Count. While the vampire up to this point had been going down the path of the romantic monster since Dean and Balderston, Coppola had accomplished what all the previous renditions of this character hadn't, in reframing it to cater almost exclusively to a feminine audience. That's not to say that there aren't elements of this film that appeal to men as well, but the way that the visuals, and especially the action, is presented, this is a movie that takes an interest in female pleasure. There are obvious moments where this is true, such as when we see the Count emerge after he's grown young again, with the soft light framing his body to highlight how attractive it is. Even more telling is that scene in the theater. Mina is shown delighted by the fact that she can pet this large, normally very scary animal, but the way that it's depicted is not for her pleasure necessarily, but for you, the audience. It's true that she's enjoying the act, but the close-up of the way that her hand is running through the thick fur is meant to evoke all that comforting softness 
of what it would be like to enjoy that tactile experience yourself. There are plenty of other implications to be drawn from this scene, but this sensual act is part of your seduction as well as Mina's. This scene is also important because of the change that it sets up for. To be fair, this scene was already changed when last we saw Dracula in 1979, and had been on its way in this direction well before even that. The assault on Mina had long since been recast in a different light, at first making her a victim of mesmerism, thus relieving her of any kind of actual desires that she might have had for the vampire, and still pushing the Count into the role of the villain, because she couldn't possibly consent to what was going on. Mama Walde was the first to offer his bride immortality without the use of hypnotism, but even then, it's not framed from her perspective, and we get the impression that it's more his will than hers. After all, she still has friends and family that she would be leaving behind for this man. There is still love between the two characters, but she isn't a strong presence in the narrative like the women who would follow her, and as such, she becomes the doomed woman in the end. Both Saberhagen's Count and the Langella Dracula are bold in their approach, and the women who love them come of their own accord and are enthusiastic, but again, it's from his point of view, so their consent is implied rather than depicted. In 1979's version, both women are welcoming of him, but there is still some room for doubt. In Coppola's version, it's Dracula who's hesitant to have her drink of his blood, but he relents only after Mina affirms that this is what she wants. What sets this apart from the other times is that this film is catering mostly to what women want to see. And while it's true that women do love their horror films, what they don't care to see, usually, is an assault on someone that they can project on. It's true that Langella offered a more tender encounter, but he was still the one to break into their windows, and there's still the off chance that this could just be put down to a spell that the ladies were under. Here, Mina is under no spell, and she's finally able to express that she wants this vampire account physically. In changing this, Coppola sets up for the end of his beastly bridegroom, wherein Mina, not Van Helsing, is the one to set him free from his monstrous sins and finally give him peace. I can't stress enough how much of a game changer this film was for the Dracula tale, and like I said, with very good reason. It is regrettable, however, that they stuck Brahms' name in the title, because it set up the false notion that this was going to be a movie based directly on his book. While there were shades of Stoker's story in there, depicting elements that had largely been ignored, and being the only adaptation to include the book's ending chase scenes, what Coppola actually did was create a version of Dracula that managed to encompass many of the other popular adaptations that had come before. There are shades of Nosferatu in here, with the use of the shadows and the part where he sees Mina's photo for the first time. The Count walking about town in his formal clothing can make a direct line back to the Universal films, as can his mannerisms. As mentioned, Mama Walde's reincarnated bride makes an appearance, as does Langella's beastly bridegroom. And it's not like Coppola skimmed out on Hammer's sex appeal, either taking it further than even they had. We don't know if the filmmakers were fans of the bootleg version of Dracula in Istanbul, but we do know that they were aware of Brett Saberhagen and his count, considering that he wrote the novelization for the film with the screenwriter, so this is more likely where they drew their connection from the vampire to the warlord. And while I can't begrudge anyone their disappointment that this film is not the take on the novel, as advertised by the title, Given what we've seen, it acts almost more like a love letter to the story itself and to the audience. After all, they are the ones who decide where this tale will go next. There have been many more turns in film and literature for this figure, including Kim Newman's book series Anno Dracula, that presents an alternative universe where the crew of light was defeated, and Dracula actually succeeded for a time in his conquest over England. In film, we've seen the Count get a Scottish makeover in the form of Gerard Butler in Wes Craven's Dracula 2000. Sometimes the Count is rather shy, hiding in the subtext of a novel such as Elizabeth Kostova's The Historian. 
Other times, he sheds his monster skin entirely to become a hero for his people, like in the latest incarnation played by Luke Evans in Dracula Untold. Wherever he goes, and in whatever form, Dracula continues to draw our attention. Bram Stoker can always lay claim to the creation of this creature of the night, but he has long since thrown his shadow into new territory, becoming more of what the changing world needs and wants to see. David Crow for Den of Geek had this to say, which sums up our count fairly well. He said that the Victorian values that created one of English fiction's greatest villains are gone, and we don't have a need for pure evil anymore. Ambiguity is far more interesting than absolutes. While some fans may bemoan the loss of Stoker's original vision, we can also appreciate how the vampire's versatility has played into his longevity. There's a reason that we don't see countless Barney incarnations or a slew of Ruthvens, though we've seen his type reemerge when we want a good Byronic vampire in pop culture. Dracula, whether he is the creeping shadow of the plague, come to destroy civilization, or just come to take your girl, embodies both our wants and our fears, and, just like any good fairy tale, can highlight whichever it is that we need to express. And with that, my dear listeners, I do believe that we have come to the end of our journey with Dracula. I hope you've enjoyed this look into this titanic character as much as I have, and maybe found out about a few adaptations that you might want to check out along the way. The show notes have many links for you to enjoy, including many extras like a virtual tour of Vlad Dracula's castle, articles that will help fill in extra information where I have run out of time, a number of other podcasts that tackle specific looks at the count, and other goodies thrown in there just for fun. And speaking of having fun, because it's Halloween, I couldn't leave my listeners without a little extra treat, could I? Tune in this evening for a very special bonus wherein I will be telling you a monstrous tale of my own. If you're too impatient for that and want to see what your treat is ahead of time, make your way over to my Patreon, where starting at the $2 level, you can be listening to everything including your Halloween bonus early. And a special thank you to those patrons of mine, those being Maggie, Tim, Jonathan, Melissa, and newcomer Rihanna for all your support. Extra special thanks goes to Jonathan Glass for his help on sound editing. Remember, if you are looking for something spooky and atmospheric to listen to this Halloween, his album The Haunted Planet is available on Apple Music and on Spotify, and it's a million times better than the Monster Mash. Listen to him instead. And we can't forget our friend of the podcast, Naomi, from Dope Nostalgia, who has some great episodes coming your way, if you'd like to escape the 19th century literature for a while and take a nice break looking at music from the 80s and 90s. But mostly, thank you to all my lovely listeners for joining me every week this past October and spending the spookiest weekends of the year letting me talk to you about vampires. And don't think I forgot about the rest of the Universal crew. This is only the beginning of our series. But to make it so you don't have to wait for too long between episodes on the monsters, I've decided to do my next showcase in six months, just in time for Valpurgis Nacht. So if you are wanting to know which of the monsters is coming up next, I'll be dropping hints between now and April. Just a reminder that we'll be going back to our regular schedule of bi-weekly episodes next month. And for November, I thought it would be nice to give the boys a bit of a break. Dracula and his hunters have had that spotlight all month for the most part, so they'll be stepping aside to let us take a look at some killer ladies next time. But until then, I want you to stay safe, keep studying, and wherever possible, let curiosity be your guide.